Welcome everybody to Film Fellows Cast 8. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Rodney, I know you cut your trip short no, to no. come here, cross country. Thank you very much. Pleasure. What I'd like to do to start is maybe just go around and get sort of a brief little history of everybody. I'm Jens Bogeheim, um, born in Chicago. Went to film school at Columbia College. Started freelancing in about 1985, shooting corporate industrials mostly with my partner Steve. In about 2000, Steve and I formed Zucuto. Uh, Zucuto Films, actually, at the time. We were a production company still at that time. Then it became a Zucuto Rentals, that was part of it, and then Zucuto USA when we were making our products. That's my little bit. How about you, Rodney? I was born in New Zealand, and I grew up with uh, you know, cameras, 8 millimeters, 16, and so on, and made a college film while I was at university in New Zealand and managed to get into the Royal College of Art, uh, just a year behind Stephen, mm -hmm. and then found myself in Toronto with a contract and was back in Northern Ireland uh, for the week after Bloody Sunday working for a Canadian network. And at that time, the BBC had 54 crews and of course only four of the top four were sent there. And I realized that, that having come from a file like that gave me a nice entree to working documentaries all over the world, which I did for some almost 15 years. Mark Irwin, DP in Toronto, suggested I come and do second unit on a movie called Youngblood. Mm -hmm. Patrick Swayze, it was a hockey movie and he needed uh, long lens work. Wound up shooting second unit for 25 days, I think it was in the end. Mm -hmm. And then never, never really went back to documentaries after that. Um, got seduced into the drama side of things. And over the years, I started doing more and more American work. And finally, uh, now in the last 10, 12 years, being based in LA. Nancy? Um, I grew up not very far from here, just a few miles north in Detroit. And uh, I started working on a very underground level in Ann Arbor, not really working, but shooting. I moved to New York and uh, answered an ad in the Village Voice to be on a movie. I ended up in the electric department. And it was absolutely serendipitous because I had been shooting a lot of stills and you know, exploring certainly natural light. I really wasn't doing any artificial lighting. And uh, boy, lighting is really where it's at. And I just, I was like a sieve. I couldn't get enough. I just loved it. And uh, in a very short time, I actually did very well in the commercial world in New York. I joined the union, uh, Navit Local 15, as an electrician. Uh, we were doing movies, small movies, and a lot of commercials. In a time when there was a lot of money, a lot of equipment, and you know, I'm very grateful I learned the right way. And then the work was documentaries, you know. There mm -hmm. Just uh, it was a way to learn on my feet and learn how to let go of perfect lighting. Um, now what about anything you're working on now you want to share with us? Uh, I just finished a DI on a movie I shot with the Red One uh, and we showed at the Tribeca Film Festival just a couple weeks ago. It, it was a small intimate drama and uh, uh, that was my, f I had been using the red and small shoots but that was the first movie I had done with it. Nice. Stephen. Oh, well I was born in South Africa. My parents moved to London, to England, when I was seven. I won't say I was educated there, but I, I was forced to go to school. I got out as soon as I could, and I went to art school. As soon as I got to art school, I got out of that because I hated it. And I had no idea how to light an egg. My slant is always towards journalism. I got jobs shooting stills in London at the right time. You know, I was in the right place at the right time. And um, rock and roll and Beatles and stuff. I found the, um, the life of a still photographer uh, lonely. Hmm. I mean, I suppose I was good at it, but I, I, I can't say I actively enjoyed the, the thing of, say, going to Zambia and taking photographs and going to the airport and putting all, all by yourself, I mean, putting the film on a plane and then going back to this hmm. ho the hotel and then worrying about shooting the next day. And you, no feedback. It was disturbing to me. And I had an opportunity to photograph special stills at Shepperton Studios, mm -hmm. so I'd go twice a week. And I loved the sense of camaraderie on the, on the set and the whole feeling of a, a, a group that worked together crew. and a crew, and yeah. I thought, this is great. Mm -hmm. So I, I got into the Royal College of Art Film School, mm 
by then I had I hadn't even gr I graduated from nothing and I'd finished nothing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so somebody took pity on me and, and liked the photographs I'd done, and I got in there. Did you guys ever work together while you were in college yeah. together? Oh, did you meet each other? We saw each other in yeah. college. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I remember you getting some infrared film for Tony. Oh, for <laughs> for for his grad film. Right. And bringing in a whole emotion load of it and we were all so impressed that you'd managed to pull it off to shoot those that little scene with the, with the infrared color. And so you got into drama features? Very slowly into film industrials, documentaries and I was shooting a documentary in Peru and there, there were all sorts of people killed and you didn't know whether you'd survive. It was a, it was a a fantastic experience because I did. And <laughs> You're here to tell the right. you know, tale. I thought, I can't make a life like this. This mm. is nuts. I was so scared that I'd get killed on these things. It was so easy. Mm -hmm. It could happen mm -hmm. so easily. Mm -hmm. And uh, began shooting commercials. Mm -hmm. And that really was great because of the lighting. I just responded to the, the aesthetics of it. Mm -hmm. And that segued eventually into, into feature films. Yeah. Anything you're working on now you can talk about? I'm, I'm, pre I'm preparing a, a film of a, of a novel. It's n not very high budget. It's called The Help. It'll be shot in Mississippi. Mm. I love that book. I find every film is uh, scary and, and exciting all at the same time. Right. So, DSLRs, now that they're around, what are you guys going to do? You don't need to light anymore. Ha <laughs> ha. Really? Why? I mean, Just comments? Not true. Nonsense. Lighting's obviously for dramatic purpose, and and um, making a film is um, a confluence of many elements: narrative, acting, and then as part of that, sound. You know, sound. Sound. <laughs> and uh, cute <laughs> sound. <laughs> and um, and design costume. I mean, I'm kidding, of course. But no, I know, but the whole thing, this, the very thought, just because you've got a fast emulsion, you don't need to light, it's, it's a, a misunderstanding. The reason I bring that up is because we have a lot of customers that call. A lot of people, of course, entry level, now that they're so inexpensive, these cameras and things, they're like, oh, yeah, this is fantastic. You know, I don't need lights anymore and all that. And, and it's like, we're like, whoa, but where do you even start? If somebody said that comment to you, you know, some kid out of film school talking to you, what would you say? I mean, the, the allure is that, that, in fact, because of the speed of the chip out of the box, you find yourself being able to get an exposure. Mm -hmm. But there's a big difference between having an exposure and actually telling exactly right. the story with light. Um, and and it, the easiest thing to do is simply go into a dark room and then light a match. Mm -hmm. Or take a flashlight well, in and just one light part of and start to explore what that means. Um, it is interesting, these cameras are pushing the ISO much higher and some of the new digital cameras will allow you to shoot at 1200, 2000 ISO. It's very interesting if you start working on the street at night and you can begin to take advantage of the way it actually looks, which prior to the last two or three years hasn't really been possible. You'd always have to put up a condor or two and add some big lighting and lay some cable and generators. And at the very least, you still might want to position your subjects so that the lights there are... Well, you still want a light. I mean, you could, you know, the background that might be yeah. lit with sodium vapors or whatever, street you know, neon, but you still have your people that are in the frame and you need to... You, you mentioned there. the other night about this <clears throat> mentor of yours who, who said it was all about the eyes and that you'd done uh, up until then had been lighting the environment mm -hmm. and, and that's part of the problem because the environment is always lit with and these cameras. And that takes the most amount of time. But that's not what's important in the right. frame when you're trying to tell a story through performance so and with anything, actors. And if anything, the, the, the units maybe now can be smaller. Yes. The, the, the setups for lighting the environment can be less. The expense will be less, things like that. But the, but the thought the effect, the look, mm -hmm. the way the light moves, the way the camera moves, the way the actors are lit and the way they look, how the story happens. This is all art. This is craftsmanship. This, yeah. is, this is control. No matter what the tool. No matter what the tool. So it's smaller or bigger. Does it? <clears throat> I think you can, you can get nuts about, I only use PA heads or I only use, do, uh, okay. use what. That, I, I couldn't yeah. care less about that stuff. What's really interesting is what, your, what the story is going to lead to and what, 
what references you get back. To me, it's far more interesting to research a film by looking at photographs and other films and art, art and the, the painting of a period or whatever than, than, than whether a DSLR can shoot at 12,000 or whether the ARRI can do at 800 or whether you're shooting 5219 and you shoot at 320 or, I mean, that is tedious in the extreme because it's not really talking mm. about the main event. And the main event in the end, after the months of pre-production and all the talk and all the worry and stuff, ends up frequently with two people at a table, a director and a cinematographer and the script supervisor and the actors. And then there's the script and that's mm. when it, that's when it gets, story, right? that's when it gets interesting. So, if the DSLR is a, a means by which the process can be democratized, mm -hmm. by which you don't need as much money to, mm -hmm. to, to make a story, you still need the actors, you still need the ideas. You, you need still the need the story. You, you still need the talent. You need the talent in front of the lens. I mean, look, mm -hmm. there's some wonderfully interesting visual work being done with, the, with these new tools, and it's almost universally poor in its narrative and its, mm -hmm. and in its uh, acting. Now, you, you've got to give people some slack. They're doing this on, on, for nothing, and they're doing it wonderfully. But or for the first time, you know. Who but knows? within a year or two, everyone will say, all right, that's great, so you can do it for nothing, but now are you going to do something good? Right. Mm -hmm. you know? And that's, I'm very excited about the equipment because there are possibilities to shoot small films and to sh shoot s stories that are perhaps not that commercial in the sense that <coughs> you, you could make a film for a, a small amount of money that looks great and it could make its money back. You know, it could attract us back to independent film. Mm. Independent film has died. This hopefully will bring us to, to a, a new wave of independent. I think it will. But it's really disturbing that so much emphasis has been on the ever-changing technology that, you know, as we sit here, by the time we finish this, something will be outdated. And, uh, you know, I can't even, you can't own equipment anymore. You know, I used to have my 16 millimeter camera, and you know, I've had... Well, at this price, you can. And then right, toss them, but right, you can. Well, I don't want to toss it, but you know, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but but you, you keep tossing stuff. Then you you you. There was a time when I could strip a a, 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 a clear ACL. I could feel it in my body when I was shooting right. with it. You know, of course, I'd had it for years. It was instinctive. You didn't right. think about it. You keep changing equipment. You don't get. That. Well, that's and, that's know. a new challenge now. Yeah. And. And we have virtually, at the moment, thrown away the painfully won victories for ergonomics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cameras now are so difficult to handle, yeah. so impossible to focus, to, <laughs> to change it. In some I ways, mean, we're going backwards. We, yeah, not some ways. I mean, <laughs> 20, 30 years ago, you could, as one person, zoom, focus, yeah. do exposure, and frame mm -hmm. with your right eye while you're watching the sound man with your left. I was um, recently uh, in London doing a seminar course for still photographers, uh, primarily who have adopted this camera, and uh, almost 40% of the people who buy the 5D and, and the various uh, HDLSR cannons are uh, using them for video. And all of a sudden, a life of strobe and shamiras yeah. and softboxes has suddenly turned into hard light and continuous light, and they're completely at a loss. They, right. they don't know where to begin. And it was very satisfying to be able to introduce them to a range of tools that we take for granted, Kinos and uh, 5600Ks, the bug light. Underlying all of this is the need for these individuals to grapple with the idea that the camera is now a moving tool, right. is a, a continuously changing frame, right. and it has a different dynamic completely from, from stills. And of course, all of this goes back to art school, studying the master's um, exposure to life. Um, I find it interesting that we all shot documentaries, and, mm -hmm. and I think this is a, a contributing factor to a stylistic change in a lot of cinema where the proscenium arch has been broken. You used to light tunnel lighting, I used to call it, where you could put flags beautifully down on a line either side, and your operators were trained to never fear off Listen. and then negotiate these things. Now it's like completely theater in the round. Let alone the question of continuity. Yeah. And that's a 
big question. Mm -hmm. The whole idea that a scene is written maybe five pages, and depending on the budget you have, you may shoot that scene over a day easily. Sure. And yet the sun comes over here in the morning and it's going to work its way over. Well, the whole so. control of the light, and if you've got more money, you can do your four pages in two days or, yes. or three days, depending on its content and the right. people in it. Now, right. you do it over two days, it's even worse because it can be sunny on one day right. and raining on the next. Right. These, these basic ABC problems of shooting film and shooting narrative film, this is a big surprise to, to a new generation. And there are hordes of them now having, oh, coming God. over. You know. And they, they could do worse than read Cow Rice editing the film. Mm -hmm. And then the basics of color correction and all this stuff. It's not to take away from the narrative drive, but I mean, mm -hmm. Sidney Lumet making movies. I mean. And also, uh, we don't have the tools on most productions of Photoshop. I mean, obviously, when we go to do our digital intermediates at the end, we're in a, on a very high level fixing parts of the frame if we choose to, but um, we have to, they have to get the exposure right and uh, they have to really learn the dynamic range of whatever medium they're shooting with, of the HDSLRs. It's really, really relevant. It may be a different box with a different lens and a different way of capturing light, mm -hmm. but it's as relevant today as it has ever been. Mm -hmm. And the whole question of how how you approach shooting and how you look at what you've got at the end of the day and, and the analysis of the work and how, it, how, how it'll work with in the cut and is, is the editor happy, is the director happy? I mean, does it work in, in, in so many ways? You know? As a photojournalist, you're working alone, so now it's a whole different animal with the collaborative well, part of the crew. So the, that's, the, 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 that's the great thing and that's the, and that's the, the bad thing.